and I'm the pastor. I'm just kidding. Guys, I've been having such an amazing time um, going into what we've been talking about. We've been, uh, uh, as just a reminder, we've been talking about reaching the one. It's all about reaching the one. Okay, and we know, we understand that reaching the one is triune. It's reaching, oh, uh, y'all got to wake up. I'm gonna, we're going to start doing some jumping jacks up in here if y'all don't wake up. Okay, here we go. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to reach, then we're going to reach, and then we're going to reach. So the one can be up, the one it can be in, because we need to be reached as well, and the one that is out there. That can be your neighbor, that can be your friend, that can be your enemy, but that person's got to be reached. We're not called city reach for no reason. We are city reach for a purpose and a reason. We need to be solidified with that. But we've been having such, I've been having such a good time with this that, 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 that as the Lord was, was directing me and as I was seeking the Lord's face on what to do this year and, and, and the focus of it is to reach the one, we've been in the book of John. We started in John 1, 1, and we've been in John chapter 1. We've been in John chapter 1 for eight weeks. Mama, can you believe we've been in John chapter 1 for eight weeks? And I want to tell you today that we're not moving further than John chapter 1 today. I was so, listen, I was like, I wanted to jump ahead and, and, and jump to John 2. I can't wait to get to John 3. Come on, somebody. I want to tell you about the woman at the well. I want to tell you about, I, I, I want to teach you about, about the gospel of, I can't get out of John chapter 1. So here we go. John chapter 1. John chapter 1 starting in verse 43. Starting in verse 43. We'll see how far we go today. And then we'll pick up the thread wherever we leave that thread off. It's a different type of preaching for me. Uh, as many of you know, I've been very much a, 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 a topical type th preacher. I, I like to preach topically and I always do. Uh, today I'll probably end up preaching end up topically so that there's a topic that you can deal with i also believe that there has to come a, that, that that when it comes to when it as when it comes to discipleship i realize this and i'm not look today i'm going to say a lot of things that you're not going to be happy with me about but ask me if i care because i do i really do care i don't care how you feel about i don't care how you feel about whether or not you're offended or not but i care because it's important for me to know that you are being discipled properly so I'm going to say a lot of things that you may not like. It may come off as offensive. But please understand that pastor loves you. And one of the things that, that, that I realize is, in, and I realize this in, 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 in many people's lives, is that if, if you come to church on a Sunday, Sundays are usually the only time that you're getting word. I got one amen that was honest. Thank you. Amen. Most of us should be saying, oh my. Listen, I, I'll be honest with you. I, I'm, I am not the 365-day the, the person in the Word. Boy, when I miss a day. <sighs> hey, 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 easy woman. My wife is a testimony. She says, when, I'm, when I miss a day, she pays the price, she says. I don't know where she gets that from, though. I'm a mild manager. Y'all know me, right? Anyway, so it's, it's, it's one of those kinds of things that, that I understand that, that most of us, if we're not in the Word every day. And when you do get in the Word, it's usually going to be on a Sunday. So what I'm trying to do is make sure that, that I'm building a foundation so that you can grow from. I'm not trying to feed you on Sunday for the rest of the week. I'm trying to give you a little bit of something. And that's been usually my, my trend. What I've decided to do this year is I'm going to stick to it. I'm going to stay in John. Wherever the thread takes me, I'll take you. And then we'll get back to another chapter in John. But we're going to take John as, uh, 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 through the year. Is that okay? And I'm going to teach it as best as I can. Now what's going to happen is I'm going to give you stuff that I may have given you before. I may give you some new stuff. But it's all going to be Bible for that you then, when you leave here, can turn around and go, hmm, that was yummy. Let me get some more. How many overeaters are in, no, forget it. <laughs> I, 
if I was to if, if I was to treat the word of God the way I overeat, huh? Because I can't just stop at one plate when it's good. We'll get to that one some other time. We're in John chapter 1, verse 43. Ears. Ears. Hearts. Father, by their confession, they've said that their ears are open. Holy Spirit, would you speak today? Would you take your servant, place him out of the way? Let the words that I speak, Lord God, be translated and interpreted into the ears of those that are hearing, so that they hear you clearly. Let that word go into our hearts and be that seed that will produce more than just a plant, more than just a stem, but that would actually produce the fruit. Let that fruit be love, and let that love be given away, and let it be all for your glory in Jesus' name. And God's people said, John chapter 1, starting verse 43. The following day, Jesus want, wanted to go to Galilee. And he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Follow me. Now Philip was from Beth Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him to whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, before Philip called you, What happens when I use a new Bible? When you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, Hereafter you shall see heaven open." And the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. This last, this last few verses in, this, in John chapter 1 lead us into a lot of discussion. I am, I am, I'm excited to preach about nothing good comes out of Reading. <laughs> but you're going to have to wait for that one. That may be May's sermon I'm excited to preach about I'm excited to preach about about the prophetics and being able to see before you even get there Jesus was able to see him there I'm excited to preach about being able to ask somebody and invite someone to come and see for themselves I'm excited to, to preach about the things that you're going to see in the future. You, sitting here today, the signs, the wonders, the miracles, the manifestations of God pre God's presence in your life and the lives of those that you want to be a part of. I'm excited about that. But I find myself stuck. I find myself in this place of that I just can't go any further. I just can't go any further right now than to deal with the command, follow me. I can't go any further. I find myself stuck there because we feel like in, in this 21st century of, of, of social media and Instagram and Twitter and uh, follow me. Are you following me on Facebook? Are you following me on Twitter? Do you follow me on Instagram? I don't even know how to do Snapchat yet. My son won't teach me. Oh, by the way, speaking of social media and information... Um, uh, today, some of you were, were a victim of data collection, okay? This is going to continue uh, uh, into next Sunday. 
I want to make sure that I have everybody's information. Uh, Eli was in the back with the computer right up until the beginning of service. Um, and what we'll do is next Sunday, if you haven't, if you haven't collected your information, you're going to be tagged so that we can uh, get this church directory up to date. It needs to be up to date. Um, uh, and I also want to be able to, to find a way to communicate better with you. Um, so that's what that's going to be about. So, um, so make sure you see Eli next, sun, next Sunday. We're going to be here. We're going to be here, right? So far, we're going to be here. I love the way the Bible says you will see greater, greater things than these. The promise of signs, wonder, miracles, and possible. I could just jump there. You know, I could just jump there because normally that's the, that, that's the, the shouting part of church. That's the excitement part of church. And like I said, some of you have already been, some of you have already heard portions of this teaching. Some of you haven't. So we're just going to go through it because I feel like if I'm going to hit something in the book of John, and it's going to come through again as an opportunity to reteach it. I'm going to take the opportunity to reteach it. Amen? So this idea of follow me, this idea of follow me, if I say follow me, most of you are just going to walk with me. Most of you are going to go in the direction that I'm going in. But this follow me is deeper than just a simple come along for the ride. Come along for the ride. But to be able to understand this, we have to go back into the educational system of a Jew. We have to understand that the Jewish culture thrived. It thrived on this idea of Torah, this idea of the Word of God, this idea of understanding this Word. And it doesn't just begin at the time that you're an adult. It doesn't begin like it did for many of us. I know that for me, many of you know my testimony. As as, as for me, I was in my 20s before I came to know the Lord. I didn't grow up in church. I didn't grow up in Sunday school. I didn't know, uh, as far as knowing about Noah and knowing about... Uh, uh, Moses. I knew about Moses because I watched the Ten Commandments on television. Do you know how heartbroken I was when I finally read it in the Bible and it didn't match the TV show? I was hurt. Some of you still believe the TV show because you haven't read it in Exodus. But that's a whole different story. That's why we're doing this. I told you I was going to say some stuff. Uh, uh, their entire lives revolve around Torah, around these five books written by Moses. Jophias was, uh, says, above all, we pride ourselves in educating our children. That's why it's so important that we today here, right now, this church, that we should pride ourselves on educating our children. We should pride ourselves on teaching our children what they need to be taught at home. If you teach them at home, they're going to excel in school. If you read to them at night, until the age that they won't, don't want you to read to them at night anymore. I think it was a couple years ago, my wife tried to sneak up into Eli's room and read him a story, and he was like, Mom, leave me alone. Or was that yesterday? I don't know. Sorry, Eli, you're the victim today. <laughs> They knew that they were only one generation away from being extinct as a religious community. We are one generation. Okay, let me bring it down to where it's real for me. Many of you know that I'm Dominican. I'm Hispanic by, by, that's how I was born. My child is Dominican because of my ethnic background and upbringing. Puerto Rican, right? In Colombia, how well do you speak Spanish? Excuse me? Not well. Do your kids speak Spanish? My kids don't speak Spanish either. We're one generation away as Hispanics that our children, that their children will not even know the language. I've got cousins that don't speak my language because we've fail to teach it to our children and now that may not be a real big deal and uh, and sometimes it is a big deal and sometimes it's not really truth truth be told it's not really a big deal (laughs) it's really one of those kind of it's really kind of one of those nationality pride things 
Okay, so my kids don't speak Spanish. So what? You better speak English well, though. We were uh, in a barber shop. And uh, forget it. Uh, let me just move on. Um, but that's one generation away from extinction when it comes to our heritage. Amen? Same thing with the Bible. Same thing with the Word. Same thing with Christianity. If we fail to teach our children, our children, listen, God is going to do what God's got to do. Please don't, don't mistake that. But imagine, imagine how much better it would be if our child and our children were raised in the church in the Word. Let me rephrase that. That were raised in the Word. Because church is such a loosely used word that they were raised in the church. It don't mean nothing today. I got folks that are unsaved that are coming that said, I was raised in the church. But you don't know Jesus. If you can't answer the question whether or not you're saved, if you can't answer the question of, of how you came to a, re a, a revelation knowledge of who Jesus Christ is and how to get to heaven, you need to come see me. Because you ain't saved. There's no maybes about it. And if you come to this church, there should be no excuses for it. And those that you know shouldn't have an excuse either. Because you told them about it. I was so grateful that, that, that and many of you know Darla. Please pray for Darla and, 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 and the situation that she's in with her mother. And, and her mother was, was uh, is at the hospital. And I went to go visit this dear woman at the hospital. I met her once before and, and I went into the hospital room and then I don't know what's going on in that hospital room. I just know this woman is, is sick. She, 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 I don't know if she's going to die, not going to die. I, I just know that I trust God and whatever's going to happen, I'm going to pray for healing because I believe God heals today. Come on, somebody. I don't, care what the, I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what people say. I don't care what the doctor says. God heals today. So I went my, with my little bottle of anointing oil and I turned around and anointed that woman. I believe God will heal her. But in the process, I needed to make sure she was saved. Hi, my name is CJ. How are you doing? Do you know Jesus? That's what I want to know. You can't get in a conversation to me about spirituality without telling me whether or not you know Jesus. We ain't got nothing to talk about then. Hello? There's that rabbit trail. Let me get back to this. It's important. Educating our children is important. We have children's church on a Sunday because it's important that we reach and teach our children. It's not enough just to go ahead and have another Sunday school. It's not enough just to have another game. It's not enough just to play. It, we, come on, somebody. We've got to teach them. We've got to teach them. And please don't misunderstand me. I'm not talking about turning around and having a youth group and teach. I mean, I know Pastor Josh did this once, and he had a great time doing it. Glory to God because he did it, he did it in a fashion that the children understood. Am I too loud? And, and he joked with me one time. He said, I'm going to teach them 16 fundamental truths of the assemblies of God. I said, go ahead, son. You do what you got to do. It's important that we educate our children. Jewish culture back in these days revolved around teaching their children. There were three stages that were involved in teaching their children. Stage one was called Bet Sefer. Is that up there? Bet Sefer. This was the house of the book. It started at age six, and it was taught in local synagogues. Basically, our Sunday school. Our Sunday school. And it was taught by a local rabbi. One of the, the beautiful things about it was that in the first day of school, the rabbi turned around and gave them and, 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 and covered their slates with honey. The slates, obviously, they, 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 used, they didn't have uh, iPads and, and paper. <laughs> they actually used slates. And what he did was he covered their slates with honey. And the purpose of that was so that the kids would, 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 would put their hands in it and they would then enjoy it and actually eat it. And it was supposed to be a, a symbol to them that this honey represented the Word of God. It represented Torah. 
or Torah, however you want to pronounce that. But it represented the word of God to them. So they would, and honey, if you can think of anything today, tell Jesus I said hi. Uh, you can, anything, if you can think of anything that is, is a delicacy, that is, that, is, that is valuable as far as food goes, this was it. This was fine. Honey, in those days, was, 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 was one of those kinds of things. It was like, if I turned around and said, let's go get some ice cream. Some of you would say, absolutely not. I'm, I'm lactose intolerant. Let's go get some yogurt. I don't know. Um, let's go to Rita's instead. Are they open yet? So, ra- so these rabbis, they would cover their slates with honey, and it was a symbol for them. Not only was it, it was a symbol of God's word and how sweet it was, but it was also a symbol of God's favor. Honey was a symbol of God's favor. And the idea was that we may, may we never forget, and he, they would teach him, may we never forget that the words of God are like honey, like the most enjoyable, pleasurable thing you could ever have. That's why the Bible says, taste and see that God is good. It's amazing how you can just take a, how such a, a small portion of Scripture can just come to life. How good is it to you? For us to call ourselves followers, <laughs> for us to call ourselves followers of Jesus, we have to ask ourselves some difficult questions. About what brings us pleasure in life. What are those things that are pleasurable? And then the question has to be, are those pleasures found in the Word of God? I can't give you zeal. I can't give you passion. The Holy Spirit, you and the Holy Spirit, have to have a desire, a hunger, a thirst. And if you lose it, You have to figure out what it is that you need to do to get back to it. Or trust me, God will find a way to draw you back to himself. I'd rather find it myself than be dragged to it. If you've never been dragged to it, uh, you you have no idea what I'm talking about. But as for a six-year-old, he would begin memorizing in in this Bet Sefer, he would begin at memorizing the Torah. Word for word. Uh, some, some, some of the, um, uh, the men that have been through our, our discipleship program as far as uh, our, our hope home would get so upset over, over a verse or two. Come on, Richard, talk to me. Over a verse or two that they had to memorize, right, in the home? They had to memorize a verse. And they would, what's that? 40. By the time they got done. Okay? 40. It started with one, right? And they fought with the one. And then when they got to 40, they were like, oh, crap, I could do this. A six-year-old, the first five books of the Bible, word for word. What? This lasted from ages 6 to 10. By age 10, they were moving forward. The second stage was Bet Talmud, or the house of teacher. This is a, a, an advanced, only a, the advanced students, those that did memorize them, those would move on, would memorize then the rest of the scriptures. Please understand that the, the, the principle here is that the most, the most prestigious position that a young Hebrew male could hold was to be a rabbi. That was it. That was, it wasn't about being a fisherman or a craftsman or a carpenter or this, that, or the other. It was about being a rabbi. 
There are very few. I mean, right now we could talk about, hey, well, you know, uh, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. I want to be a police officer. I want to be all those other kinds of things. But nobody's screaming out at the young age, I want to be a pastor. I thought it was funny. I mean, I ask my son every, every few months, what do you want to be? Not once did he say pastor. Not only by the age of 10 would they move into this Bet Talmud, but they would also move into understanding the art of Jewish questions and answers. Here in the Western system, you've heard me speak on this before, the teacher teaches and the student listens and memorizes the answers to give back to the teacher. This is what we do in the classroom. We give you the lesson, we give you the answers to the lesson, and then we give you the test based on the lesson we gave you. Are you tracking with me? This is how we do it. This is not the way they did it. Here's a, a, an example. If I say 2 plus 2, you would say, pretty simple, right? Why? Because you had to learn what 2 plus 2 was. You didn't learn that, that gathering, that gathering of, of, maybe you did at, at a young age. I don't know how you learned math, but with this new math stuff. You, you learned that 2 plus 2 is 4, that 2 plus 4 is 6. You learned that. Multiplication table, the same kind of way. You learned, you memorized your multiplication table. Did anybody learn multiplication any other way than memorization? Good. Just checking. Jewish culture then, what they did was they had you in a process to think and understand the issue and take the discussion further. It wasn't good enough that you knew what the, you, that you memorized the material. You had to understand the material. So, if we were in, in this environment learning this, this, this question and answer type of, type of thing, I would say to you, what is 2 plus 2? You would answer with, what is the square root of 16? Boom. Psst. Okay, what is, <laughs> what is then 16 divided by 4? Would be another appropriate answer. Because you didn't just give the answer, you understood what the answer was, and you took it in a different direction. Jesus always asks questions and responds with questions. Not always, but in most cases you would see him ask a question and respond with a question. He interacts with the scriptures as he teaches them. This is why some of us, to us, as we're reading as New, as New Testament believers and we're reading the scriptures, and we read the story about Jesus, we read the story about Jesus being left at the temple at the age of 12. What was he doing? He was teaching. Because he was in the house of teacher. That was his age. That's what he was supposed to do. He was supposed to be with the rabbis and with the teachers. He was going back in this question and answer thing because they were questioning him and he was answering them. He was in a discussion with them. He was at the right age to be doing these things. And that's why his response to his parents was, what do you think I would be? I was in the house of my father. I was in my father's house. I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. Brings it a little bit more to life. Stage three is called Bet Midrash, or the house of learning. This is for 14 and above. They would go into here to become rabbis. This is the Harvard and the Yale. This is, this is the elite of the elite. This isn't, just, this isn't just graduating high school. They would have graduated high school at age 10, if, you, if, you, if you're catching what's going on here. They wouldn't just be going to community college. They would be going not just to a District 1 school. They would be going to an Ivy League with a scholarship. Are you catching me? Does any of this make sense as I'm speaking these? So here they are. They're, they, 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 they have this, the, the, their dream job is coming true for these Jewish boys. But to be able to do so, they had to be chosen. They had to be chosen. And you had to be chosen by 
rabbi. They would go into, they would go and ask a rabbi, or they would find a rabbi, they would say, I want to be one of your disciples. I want to be a, 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 a I, I want to be a disciple of yours. What, what do I got to do? They would come asking. This is, gonna, th- this is important for later. Rabbis would then question to see how well they knew the text. To see how good they were. To see if they, were, if they, could, if they could live up to it. The answer then to the text would be in a, what's called a remiz or remez. And here's an example. An example is found in, in, in Luke chapter 10, verse 25. If you want, let's go ahead and jump to, to Luke. Luke, 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 Luke. Luke. I got some time. Look at that. Luke 10. Luke 11, Luke 10. Mm. Nope, wrong one, sorry. Give me a second. I'll find where I was going. Hey. This is what happens. This is what happens when you go off script. Yeah, let's go to 30. Thank you. That's what happens. You, you know when you get used to using a particular Bible and you highlight it and you underline it? See, I wouldn't qualify to be a rabbi back in those days. Luke 10, 25, and behold, a certain law. Yeah, that's right. I was in the right spot. Come on. See, I didn't have my, see, I didn't have my, little, my little chapter verse thing there. Okay, so t- 25, it says, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written? What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? What is written, and what is your reading of it? What does it say, and how do you understand it? Following. Okay? So not just what does it say, but what's your understanding of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Wow. That's what it says. Now, how do you understand it? And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this and you shall live, and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Stop. When you find yourself in that type of position that, you're, that you understand the text, or you know the text but don't understand it, you then have to find a better justification for yourself. Are you tracking with me? It's not good enough if I turn around and say, I am a follower of Jesus Christ and I forgive Except for, that means you don't understand the text. You know the text because you know that you should forgive as you were forgiven. But you fail to walk in the text because you don't understand the value of the text. I don't say you, I say we. I don't say we, I say me. Are you tracking with me? When I fail to forgive, when I fail to to do those things, it's not because I don't know the text. I know the text. I've preached the text. I've studied the text. What I do is I fail to walk in the text because my understanding of the text doesn't go deep enough to be able to make it part of my walk. That's basic stuff, amen? Can I get an amen on basic? So now Jesus says, you've answered rightfully so. But now he begins to justify himself like, yo, who's my neighbor? (laughs) I don't want to have to forgive everybody. So this is where Jesus then begins to answer the question. This isn't just a parable. Please understand this. 
This is a form of answering the question so that you can, so that you can come to the conclusion for yourself. You hear what I'm saying? The Holy Spirit wants you to come to some conclusions about truth for yourself. He's already revealed truth to you, but now you have to experience truth. That was good. He could have just given you the answer. Amen? I don't know about some of you, but I'm pretty, I'm, I'm pretty knuckle-headed. You don't have to say amen to that. I, I, I don't learn like everybody else learns. Uh, there's a lot of things that I've had to learn. Now that I'm older, I'll be honest with you, I, I can't go through that kind of pain no more. So I try to learn from other people, amen? <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just not built like that no more. But when I was younger, hard head. If you consider yourself a hard head, that means you don't learn like other people learn. That means you learn through experience. And sometimes those experiences ain't pleasant. Can I at least get one amen there? Hello? Your experiences are to teach you something. That's a whole different message. Scholars believe that Jesus spoke in 22 remezes in the New Testament. That means the fashion in which he responded to questions was with a question so that it would reveal the answer of the text. If the disciples, here we are, if the disciples was the best of the best, the rabbi, if the disciples was the best of the best, then the rabbi would then choose this disciple or this person to be his disciple. Keep in mind that in every situation, and, and, and you can figure this out in your own life, but People have hidden agendas. Rabbis had an agenda. They wanted to perpetrate, or not perpetrate, perpetuate. <laughs> See? I got to stick to two syllable words. When I get past three, I get in trouble. They wanted to make disciples after themselves. They wanted to, to teach what was called their yoke. They wanted to teach their understanding of Scripture. They wanted to make mini-me's. Are you tracking with me? So they would look at us, or they would look at you and say, no, yes, you. He's looking for disciples that would be capable of carrying out his teaching, his yoke to the people. He would ask himself, does this student have what it takes? Can this student be, watch this, can this student be like me? Can this student be like me? Can he do what I do? If the rabbi decided or decides that you could be like him, and if the rabbi decided that you had the potential to do what he could do, then he would say, come, follow me. Now follow me has a whole deeper understanding than just simply... See, when we read the text, we see Jesus saying, okay, you come follow me, okay, you come follow me. Here's the other catch. And we'll get into this uh, probably a little bit better. Jesus went and found his disciples. His disciples didn't come to him. That's why he says... You didn't choose me. I chose you. But see, at this point, you would leave everything. You would leave everything. You would leave everything and follow your rabbi. You would then devote your life to being like your rabbi. You would do everything that he would do. You would want to do everything Everything that the rabbi did, you wanted to copy. Like little kids. You know little kids, they walk around, stop copying me. No? Age range over here is, stop copying me. Stop copying me. No, that's exactly what you would do. Listen, back when I was growing up, um, Bruce, what was this called? 
What do we call that? No, nope, that's, tw- that's, that's 21st century word. But if my rabbi walked like this, I'm walking like this. 21st century, swag. Whatever it was that my rabbi had, not only did he say that I could have it, he said I could be like it, that means I should do it. There wasn't a question of if he did it, I could do it too. Why? Because he taught it to me. That means if you, the way he prayed, I wanted to pray like he prayed. If my rabbi got on the ground and uh, on his knees and threw his hands up in the air, guess what I'm doing? I'm getting on my knees and throwing my hand up in the air. If my rabbi went down and laid on, on the floor, then guess what I'm doing? I'm laying down and I'm getting on the floor. If my rabbi fasted, I fasted. If he ate, I ate. Not only did I eat, but I ate what he ate. If he drank, I drank. Hello? I did what my rabbi does. Why? Because I want to be like my rabbi. And the only way, the best way for me to learn how to be like my rabbi is not just to be with my rabbi, but to do what my rabbi does so I can experience it. In other words, I have to experience my rabbi. What? We can't keep going and walking around talking about, I want to be like Jesus if you ain't trying to walk like. I think it's time for a water break. You want nothing more than to be exactly like your rabbi. There would be a blessing or a saying or or a, a... yeah, a blessing that would be said over a, a child or a young disciple that chose to follow in the way of his rabbi. And this blessing would, would be either a parental blessing or a blessing from, from a teacher. And, and, it would, and it would go along the lines of, may you be so committed. May you be covered. I'm sorry. May you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. May you be so committed to being like your rabbi. May you follow with such passion that you followed your rabbi so closely that you actually got a face full of dust. And there's there's all kinds of controversies of whether or not you get a face full of dust or not. But the idea is that you'd be so close, so close to your rabbi that whatever he experienced, whatever, whatever dust he kicked up, it would affect you. How close are you to Jesus? Now, here's the sad part. Because in this process of trying to become, to, to, to be a, a, a disciple of a rabbi, you, a lot of these young men and young men would reach a point of disappointment. Because either the rabbi said, come follow me, or he would respond by saying, you know Torah, but you don't have what it takes to be like me. You should go learn your father's trade. That was a, for a young man, that was one of those, oh, I can't be a rabbi, so I'm going to go be a doctor. I'm going to go be a lawyer. In the next few weeks, we're going to talk about, I'm going to go be a fisherman. Let's jump. Rabbis each had their own interpretation. We spoke about that. When you followed your rabbi, you would place yourself under the yoke of that rabbi. You would place yourself under that teaching. I am so glad that my rabbi said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We'll talk a little bit more about this next week in Matthew 4. We're going to take this follow me and see how how it affected uh, uh, Peter 
um, uh, and Andrew, his brother, and we're going to talk about casting the net and those kinds of things. But now you understand why they were fishermen. Because they were rejects. Go learn your father's trade. But yet Jesus responded to them in that same scripture. He says, but I will make the fishers of men. That's the launch for next week. Jesus said, follow me. Because you can be like me. Follow me. This doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you look at it just from that perspective. But if you look at the story in Matthew 14, and Jesus is walking on water. They think he's a ghost. The disciples in the boat, they think he's a ghost. Verse 28, he, his disciples and... If you go to verse 28, you see this whole thing unfold. And here's Peter, and, and, and he says, if it is you, then, then just, I'll go out there. The supernatural peace is not that Peter... The peace that I want you to understand is not that that Peter walked on water, but he got out of the boat. And I got a whole message on that one too. I'll leave that one for another time as well. And Peter, and Peter said, I want to be like you. I want to do what you do so badly that if that's you walking on water and I want to be like you, I can do what you do. I'm going to step out of this boat and I'm going to walk on water. When was the last time you actually tried, or we actually tried, to move in the supernatural? When was the last time you actually got a hold of someone and said, I'm not talking about a prophetic word that we can read. That's great, good stuff. But you would actually turn around and, and say, you know what? Be healed in the name of Jesus. I believe that God heals today. Be healed. Let your sight be restored. When? At random. Anybody. At work. Stepping out of the boat was easy for Peter because Jesus was there. Step out of your boat into an area that's uncomfortable for you and actually speak to somebody truth of what... First time I did that, I thought I was going to die. I was at work in the hallway. I'm almost done. I was at work in the hallway, and this lady comes, and she's there, and she's telling me about how sick she is and so on and so forth. And I said, you know, I believe that Jesus healed. I, I didn't say it like that. I said, I could, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm sorry. It, sometimes we like to, 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 to make it sound a whole lot better than what it really was. You know, and then the Holy Spirit says, stop lying. Okay. At least he does to me. I don't know about you. You know, you want to exaggerate it a little bit to make it look more. It, it wasn't like that. It really wasn't. This lady comes in the hallway. And she tells me that she's, is she's suffering through whatever conditions that she was suffering through. And I remember inside of me, it was like a burning inside. It was like, I was like, it was like. I don't know, indigestion. I don't know what it was, but I come to realize it was the Holy Spirit. And it was like one of those, pray for her. No. Pray for her. No. And then all of a sudden out of my mouth, I said, you know, I, I, um, uh, I think I said, I will keep you in prayer. Because I believe what the Bible says about healing, I believe that God can heal you. I believe that's what I said. What she heard was, I will pray for you right now and you will be healed. Because that's not what I said. I wasn't that bold. 
I wasn't that courageous. I remember saying, I will keep you in prayer. You know how I know? Because after I said that to her, I started making a beeline to my cube. And she said, what, right now? Yes. Here I am at work. Lord, <laughs> touch this woman. Heal her. In the name of Jesus. And then all of a sudden, I let, I, I don't know, I, you just go into things that you know. I, you, when you don't know, you just start praying in tongues. So I started praying in tongues. And I started believing God. And I started just, and I had my eyes closed. Cause I, I, I don't know if I had my eyes closed because I was trying to be spiritual. I had my eyes closed. I didn't want, I didn't want to see anybody see me. You know, you put you like a stork. You put your hand, head in the sand, right? And I prayed. And I believed. I'd like to be able to tell you the testimony. Oh, yeah, she got healed and all this other wonderful, magnificent thing. But it wasn't about her that day. I'm sure she got healed. It was about me. Because I needed to move into that next level. Take a chance. See what that does to your faith. Stop worrying about what the effect is going to be and what the manifestation is going to be. Just take a chance on you. You know why? Because you're a follower of Jesus. You can do what he does. Ooh, that was good. Take a chance. Jesus said to Peter, he says, you have little faith. Who does Peter lose faith in? Jesus? Is, is Jesus having trouble walking on water? I don't think so. Peter loses faith that he can actually do it. He loses faith in his ability to be like his rabbi. But didn't his rabbi already say to him, Follow me, because I believe in you, and you can be like me, and you can do what I do. Let's change our thinking a little bit. Maybe we need to start believing and start understanding that Jesus has faith in us, in me, in you, and our ability to be like him. Quit saying, I can't do that. You can do it. Just do it. Let the manifestation of what you do be his responsibility, not yours. And I'm not just talking about the supernatural. I'm not just talking about laying hands on people and seeing them healed. I'm not just talking about, about prophetic words and tongues. And I'm not talking about the signs, the wonders, and the miracles. Sometimes the biggest sign and miracle and wonder, can you just be trying to walk like Jesus? Sometimes it can be just as simple as the internal thing of forgiving somebody. Of, oh. That's the real miracle right there. That's the real struggle right there. Because let me tell you, if you can get past that, the laying of hands is easy. That's the easy stuff. Hello? The internal stuff is the hard stuff. Those are the things that we have to fight with. Those are the demons that we struggle with. Those are the things that when we get past, we can move into the supernatural. Until we don't deal with what's inside, we can't deal with what's on the Oh, God help me. Jesus actually believes that you and I can actually be like him. You can be like him. Stop looking at me like I'm crazy. I am crazy. But I believe the truth of the word. He said he chose you. He chose us. All other students, all others waited for students. All other rabbis waited for students to come to them. They were the top ten of their class. Jesus went out and called the losers, the broken, the destitute, the addicts, the hurt, the abused. He called you and he called me to be with him and follow him. 
Here it goes. Here it goes. And I'm, I'm going to be done with this. And you can do whatever you want to do. Okay. How many of you have faith in Jesus? Do you have faith in Jesus? Maybe just a little faith. Maybe just mustard seed faith. Maybe just, just enough to call it saving faith. Amen? I believe Jesus. I'm going to heaven. That's all I know. That's all I need to know. I haven't gotten past that point. And right now I'm okay with that. We always look at faith going upwards. Amen? Have you looked at faith going sideways? Did, did you have faith in me? You have faith in me? You have a certain amount of faith, amen? I have a certain amount of faith in you. I have a certain amount of faith that you can do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. At least I hope so. There's, there's that hope piece of faith, but we'll get into that some other day. But how amazing it is for you to change your understanding of faith and to know that he has faith in you. Not just that you have faith in him, but he has faith in you that you can be like him. He would never ask you or try to accomplish in you something that he didn't already know and was assured that you could do. Amen. That's a shout moment right there. Uh, I went a little bit longer than I wanted to today. That's not unusual. So I'm going to open up the altars. If you need prayer, our pastors will come wherever they're at. I know they're out here somewhere. Prayer partners will come. Um, before, you, before you guys turn around, just face me. You guys just turn around and face me. I've discovered something. Brother Bruce, where you at? He's always trying to hide on me. I've discovered something, not discovered, I actually knew this. It's just a matter of, of dealing with it. I need for each one of you, each one of you that are going to be laying hands on people, and each one of you that are going to be praying for somebody, as they come, if they come, when they come, even if they don't come. The rest of you, you can go into your, you can go ahead and bust out your iPhones and tweet and Facebook, whatever you want. I just want to talk to you guys just for a second. Before you guys receive anyone to pray for, one, uh, give me a second. You can put, take a seat. They'll be ready in a minute. Before you guys do that, Adela, get you behind up here too. What are you doing sitting there? You are the teachers. You are the teachers. You are the leaders of this church. You are the rabbis, so to speak. Each one of you, in your own circle, in your own circle of influence, each, can you just, I got it. No, that's okay. Turn that off. Each one of you, in your own circle of influence, teaches others and I challenge each one of you before you turn around to take some time for yourself and before anyone comes with their doubt of how they can't be like Jesus and how they can't do what Jesus does I want you to self reflect and understand for yourself first not that you can be like Jesus that you are like Jesus. That means that the very authority that God has given you and the ability to be able to lay hands like Jesus to you, each one of you can do so. That means that every word that you speak in faith is a word that is spoken that must manifest itself. Don't worry about the actual physical manifestation. Don't worry about the timing of the manifestation. Don't just get rid of your doubt. And know that for yourself this is possible right here right now.